Okay, how about we just get started? So welcome everyone to CS330 for day one of this uh, fall quarter. It's very strange fall quarter. Um, let's start with introductions. So my name is Chelsea. I am a uh, assistant professor here at Stanford. This is actually the start of my second year at Stanford. So it's been an interesting first uh, couple years and I'll be the kind of main instructor for the course. Uh, I'm really excited that we're going to have uh, Carol Hausman be giving a few of the lectures. Uh, Carol completed his PhD at USC and he's done foundational work in multitask reinforcement learning, skill discovery, and hierarchical reinforcement learning. Uh, and having him give some of the lectures will hopefully mix things up a little bit so that you don't just see, uh, see my face and hear my voice. So, Carl, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Um, thanks, Chelsea, and hi, everybody. Um, as Chelsea said, my name is Carol. Um, I'll be giving a few lectures, and I'm really excited about this. Um, I'm a research scientist at Google Brain, um, so I'll also try to tell you a little bit about um, how it works at Google and how you can apply some of the things that you'll learn in this class. Um, and yeah, I'm very excited to be here and looking forward to, to our classes together. Um, the next thing I'd like to acknowledge is uh, that 2010, 2020 has obviously been a really tough year so far and uh, we're only about here uh, in the year and it's going to remain a tough year for the duration of the course. Um, mainly, like pandemics, fire season, social justice issues, they're not going to become resolved overnight and there's a, really a lot of important issues that are going on outside of the course that may kind of have your attention for for the entire quarter. Um, and I know that many of you may be facing numerous challenges ranging from these, coming up from these, these different issues going on around the world. Uh, and I saw many, many of those challenges um, uh, that, that students were having when I was teaching in the spring. So above, above all else, above kind of what's going on in this course, I encourage you to really make sure to take care of yourself uh, and, and make sure that you're kind of putting yourself over um, yourself and your health over everything else. Um, and I hope that kind of overall, I hope that this course will be a more enjoyable break from everything else that's going on in the world. Um, with that, uh, what is the plan for CS330? Okay, um, and in addition to the lectures, I'm hoping to incorporate some case studies of important and timely applications that I think are relevant to the world that we're in today. Uh, so for example, we're going to be talking about uh, multi-objective learning in the YouTube recommendation system, which obviously has implications for uh, for how, um, for not just the YouTube recommendation system, but also other recommend recommender systems and uh, which may kind of have really societal impacts, uh, whether it be political or, or otherwise. Uh, we'll also talk about my learning for a few shot land cover classification, which is uh, a relevant application in the context of climate change and, uh, and so forth. And then we'll also uh, talk about few shot learning in GPT-3, which was a very recent paper that came out um, and showed what, what things look like when you really scale Meta learning models to large amounts of data and very large models. So here's a range of the topics that will be covered in the course. This ranges from multitask learning and transfer learning to uh, meta learning algorithms to more advanced meta learning topics, including topics such as meta overfitting and unsupervised meta learning. Um, and we'll also talk about how this connects to hierarchical Bayesian models. We'll then dive into how these techniques can be combined with techniques in reinforcement learning when you're faced with sequential decision-making problems. This will include multitask RL, goal-conditioned RL, meta-RL, and hierarchical RL. Uh, and lastly, we'll talk about lifelong learning and some open problems in the field. Okay, um, an emphasis will be on deep learning techniques and uh, the kind of later six lectures in the course will be on in like this reinforcement learning domain. Okay, topics we won't cover. So um, we won't generally be covering topics in AutoML, including architecture search, hyperparameter optimization, and learning optimizers. However, a lot of the underlying techniques will be covered. Um, and so this will kind of, should prepare you to be able to read papers on these topics. Okay, 
So, um, why study multitask learning and meta learning? Uh, and to start with this, I'm actually going to talk about a little bit of my research first uh, and talk about why I care about multitask learning and meta learning. Uh, and then I'll talk about some other reasons to care about multitask learning and meta learning. So, uh, in my lab, a lot of the research that we do is studying how we can we enable agents to learn a breadth of skills in the real world. And when I say agents, I mean actually real robots in the world. Robots like this robot that can uh, put a bread block into a shape starting cube, that can watch a video of a human doing something and figure out how, what to do and how to do the task as well. Uh, and also robots that can figure out how to use tools to accomplish tasks. Um, so these are examples of, of some of the, the work that we've done on robots. And you might ask, well, why should we work, why work with robots? It seems like robots are a lot of work um, to deal with. But I think that robots can teach us things about intelligence and what it means to be intelligent. Um, they're faced with the real world. Uh, they have to be able to generalize across tasks, across objects and across environments for them to actually be useful in human environments. They need some form of common sense understanding in order to do well and in order to operate well in the real world. And also supervision can't be taken for granted. We don't really know exactly what sort of supervision we should be providing to robots uh, in contrast to other kind of standard machine learning problems like supervised learning problems. Uh, so I think that robotics is kind of a, a really challenging problem and can motivate a lot of um, a lot of uh, kind of problems in the realm of artificial intelligence. And to kind of talk about how this connects to multitask learning and meta learning, I want to tell a bit of a story. So uh, I began my PhD in around 2014. Uh, I was a PhD student at UC Berkeley, and uh, at the start of my PhD. I, there was a project going on that was trying to train a robot with reinforcement learning to learn a task like this. And uh, in particular, what the robot is trying to do is it's trying to figure out how to insert those wheels into the toy airplane, how to essentially assemble the last part of the plane. And what's cool about this is that the robot is learning really from scratch. It didn't know what to do uh, and is figuring out through trial and error how to eventually perform this last step of the assembly process. Um, so I thought this was pretty cool, uh, but there was a bit of a catch, which is that the robot actually had its eyes closed. Um, the robot wasn't actually using its camera in any way to solve this task. It was just blindly like trying to figure out how to stick the, the wheels into the plane. And this motivated uh, for me, try, kind of the obvious and clear next step here was to try to actually allow the robot to learn these kinds of tasks, but also learn perception as a part of that. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to figure out how the robot might learn a neural network that maps from images taken from the robot's camera to the torques applied at the robot's joints. And again, here the robot is starting from scratch and is learning through trial and error how to insert the red block into the shape sorting cube. And it actually needs to use it vision to be able to see where the shape sorting cube is in this case. And over the time, it learns and it figures out how to do the task. And it figures out how to do the task in, um, in the way such that if I'm holding the cube in front of the robot, it can also figure out how to do that. And you can see the robot's viewpoint right here. Uh, so we were pretty excited about this result that we could learn a neural network end to end that, that can solve this manipulation task. We were excited about it, not because the robot could put the red block into the shape certain cube, but because the robot had a kind of a general purpose reinforcement learning algorithm that allowed it to solve a number of tasks. It could also learn how to place the claw of a toy hammer underneath the nail. Uh, it could figure out how to screw a cap onto a bottle. Uh, and with a similar technique in, in follow-up work, the robot could, whoops, um, the robot could uh, use a spatula to lift an object into a bowl. Although it looks like this video isn't playing. Um, but maybe you can trust me that it, it's able to figure out how to use the spatula to lift the object. 
Um, so this is pretty cool. And a number of other works kind of built upon this method on their own robot to learn other tasks like use it, hitting a puck into a goal, opening a door, and throwing an object to hit the target. And around the same time, uh, other folks at DeepMind, for example, were leveraging some similar algorithms to play Atari games, to play Go, to learn locomotion skills, and so forth. So we were pretty excited, but we had a bit of a problem with these algorithms. And the problem was that the robot was learning this one task in this one environment starting from scratch. And if, for example, you gave the robot a different spatula or a different bowl, the robot wouldn't be able to complete the task. It would completely fail, and you'd have to just train it again from scratch with that spatula and that bowl if you wanted it to succeed. Uh, so this is a problem, uh, especially if you care about building robots that can do many different things and can be generally useful. Uh, and you might ask, well, maybe we could just give it more spatulas. But behind the scenes, if you looked at what the robot, um, what the training process looked like for many of these systems, it looks something like this, where the robot will kind of hit the puck or attempt to hit the puck into the goal. Uh, and then kind of a human will come in and reset the puck position and maybe reset the goal position too throughout the process. And one thing you might notice in this video, this is my friend Yevgen. Uh, Yevgen is actually doing more work than the robot is doing in this case. Uh, this picture seems a little bit backwards. And perhaps more importantly, it's really not practical to collect a lot of data this way. And so if we wanna kind of instead build more general purpose robots, we may need to rethink the way that we're collecting data and training these methods or training these, uh, training these models. So there's this issue that they rely on detailed supervision and guidance, and this isn't just a problem with reinforcement learning and robotics. Uh, it's also a problem arguably with many other machine learning systems as well. So while machine translation systems and object detection systems have been quite successful at processing many different diverse inputs, uh, they're still training one task from scratch with very detailed supervision. And if you want that same system to do many other things, if you want it to tell you a story, or if you want your object detection system to also kind of tell you something about oranges and bananas, it isn't able to do that. So in this sense, I'd call all of these systems specialist AI systems, um, in the sense that they're doing really just a single task, often in a single environment. Uh, and instead, a lot of my motivation for studying more general algorithms is looking at the way that humans learn. So if you look at the way that kind of humans learn much more general skills and behaviors, uh, they learn by exploring a very rich and, rich and diverse environment. They don't need a lot of supervision in comparison to the way that we train machine le supervised learning systems. Um, and they're able to learn uh, with a lot of autonomy. Uh, so in this sense, I would kind of refer to humans as more generalists. We're able to do many different things and leverage kind of very diverse experiences in order to do so. Um, and so if you thought about kind of uh, something like AlphaGo, the analogous kind of human thing would be, would be looking at uh, kind of taking a baby, Tabula Rasa, who hasn't learned anything yet and training them to play Go uh, from day one. Uh, that's kind of the analogy of what Go, what, um, kind of our current AI systems look like. And if you think about this kind of more critically, this seems really silly. Uh, perhaps we should instead be thinking about um, how to actually train these systems to do much broader tasks and learn much broader things about the world from day one. Okay, so that's uh, a bit about my research and why I'm kind of pretty excited about building more generalist machine learning systems and the topics in this course. Um, and beyond robots and beyond general purpose machine learning systems, why else should we care about multitask learning and meta learning? Uh, and first I'll talk about, well, why should we care about deep learning? So um, kind of deep is in, the, is in the title of this course. And so, Many of you probably don't need too much motivation for using deep learning, but there are a few reasons why I care a lot about deep learning. So if you go back to the 
kind of mid 2000s, the really the common technique for solving computer vision problems was to hand design features. So people would use something called like hog or sift or something else uh, to acquire some kind of mid-level features and then they would design something else on top of that like a deformable parts model to get some higher level features and then they would train a classifier on top of that. So this is basically like how everyone did computer vision uh, back in the 2000s. And then in 2012 and, and more modern computer vision, computer vision systems, they basically take this pipeline, which is first very hand designed. Each of these kind of components, hog and deformable part models, each of those need to be hand designed by a user. And it's also quite brittle because um, if one part of the system doesn't do what you expect, then the other parts down the road aren't able to handle that. So what mo modern computer vision systems do is they take this kind of pipeline model, take a big neural network and train this neural network end to end for the task of predicting poses of, of people or whatever you want it to output. So one of the things that this does is it's deep learning essentially allows us to handle whatever inputs we want, whether it be pixels, language, sensor readings, etc, rather than handling kind of a low dimensional process representation. And as a result, it's a kind of a very general purpose uh, toolbox for allowing us to process a wide variety of inputs without having to hand engineer features without a ton of domain knowledge about a particular area. Um, so this allows us to apply these techniques much more broadly. Uh, and then of course, the second thing is beyond having to hand engineer things and beyond the ability to uh, process many kinds of inputs, deep learning also works really well. So this is the ImageNet competition results over the year from 2011 to 2016. And basically, uh, this point right here is AlexNet. Everything before this was kind of hand-engineered models, and everything after this was deep neural network models. So we see this pretty huge gap between the hand-engineered models and the neural network models, and uh, as when they're in initially introduced, and then we also see, of course, a continued improvement throughout the years after that. Uh, and it's, of course, it's not just uh, a thing in computer vision. Uh, if you look at machine translation, for example, in 2016, Google introduced this paper that really made huge strides in machine translation. Um, basically, what this is comparing is a phrase-based machine translation system to a, a machine translation system based on neural networks. And you see these huge gains. If you look at, um, they're looking at human evaluation scores on a, on a scale of zero to six, and you see these huge gains from um, typically in the high fours um, from the phrase-based system to the mid fives uh, from the neural system and, and kind of a relative improvement, uh, large relative improvements across the board for all language pairs. And really, this is also what's behind um, what's behind Google Translate that you use today. Okay, so that's kind of an explanation of, of why deep learning. Um, what about multitask learning and meta learning? So one thing that we've learned from deep learning is that if we take very large and diverse data sets and use deep learning, uh, combine those with, with large models, then we get kind of the outcome of that is we get very broad generalization. We've seen this time and time again with ImageNet, with transformer models, with Google Translation. However, in many different applications, we don't necessarily have a large data set. So in medical imaging, for example, in robotics, in personalized education, medicine, recommendation systems, when you want to translate more rare languages, we often don't have a huge data set for every robot or every patient or every student. And so these techniques may not actually be that useful or applicable to these very real world problems. Um, and so it's impractical to learn from scratch for each disease, for each robot, for each person, for each task. Uh, and this is where, this is one of the areas where multitask learning and meta learning can come into play. Uh, beyond that, what if your data has a long tail? So in many real world situations, we don't have these nice like Gaussian distributions or something. We see this uh, kind of very long tail of the data where for some, for some objects, we see them all the time, uh, but for other objects, we only see a few instances of them 
in the tail of that distribution. Uh, or maybe this is not obvious encounters, but interactions with different people or words that we've heard. Maybe some words we hear all the time and some words we don't hear all the time or driving situations and so forth. Uh, this is a setting that really breaks the standard machine learning paradigm because once you're in this part of the tail, they really don't see a lot of data. Uh, beyond that, what if you need to quickly learn something new? Um, you want to learn about a new person or you want to learn for a new task or about a new environment. This is something that also comes up all the time. And so as an example of this, I actually want to give all of you a little test, a quiz. It won't be for a grade or anything. Um, whoops. Here we go. Um, so in particular, I'm going to give you a training data set. Your training data is on the left. You have six data points. Three of them are the Three data points on the left are paintings by Brock, and the three uh, data points on the right are paintings by, by Cezanne. And your goal is, given this training data, can you classify which uh, painter is uh, painted the right data point? And I'm going to do this with a poll. So I'll give you a minute to think about this and try to figure out if this kind of image on the right was painted by Brock or by Cezanne. And then you can enter what you think in the poll on Zoom. Can everyone see the poll? It is by one of these two painters. It's not a trick question. It's also not a deep fake. Great, so it's 77% Brock. That is the correct answer, uh, which is good. Uh, most of you are, are very good few shot learners. Um, and if, if you're curious, the way that you can see this is that the, you can see kind of all sorts of kind of lines in the Brock drawings, and you also see some of those lines, um, some of those kind of more um, more geometric shapes in the in the test data point as well. Okay, so this is exactly what few shot learning is, uh, where uh, you're given a very tiny data set, and you want to be able to make a prediction based on that data set. How do you accomplish this? Well, if you trained a machine learning system from scratch on these just six data points, it would probably do pretty abysmally. Uh, and so what's different is that you have prior experience. Uh, you're not learning completely from scratch. And while you may not have seen these particular paintings before, or maybe you haven't even seen paintings from these two painters before, uh, you have prior experience of uh, the styles of different painters or maybe just generally prior experience of looking at images uh, and this allows you these sorts of priors about the world allow you to solve this task okay so um really for all these reasons laid out if you want a more general purpose system if you don't have a large data set if you have a long tail distribution or if you want to quickly learn something new these are all elements of where multitask learning and meta learning can come into play Cool. So what is a task? Um, the, for now, um, and also what is multitask learning? So for now, um, a task is going to be a data set and a loss function that um, where you want to produce a model. So your task is given a data set and a loss function. Um, you want to produce a model that does well, that minimizes that loss function on that data set. And different tasks can vary based off of different objects, different people, um, maybe that you have different objective functions, or maybe you have different lighting conditions. Um, you want to be able to classify objects in different lighting conditions. Maybe different tasks correspond to different words um, or translating between different languages and so forth. So the definition of a task that we'll use in this class is a lot broader than the kind of semantic meaning of task, uh, they can vary really in, in all of these different ways. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind throughout the course. Uh, one really critical assumption that we're going to make is that different tasks need to share some amount of structure. If they don't hold any structure at all, then you're going to be better off using single task learning. Uh, but the good news is that there are many tasks with some amount of shared structure. So um, here are a couple pictures of me doing some 
object manipulation tasks. In particular, trying to open a, the lid of a jar or open the cap of a water bottle or uh, grind some pepper. And in each of these cases, while they may seem kind of very different from a semantic point of view, the actual physical motion of these tasks is very similar. Um, and even if these tasks are seemingly, un even if the set of tasks that you have are seemingly unrelated, uh, we do know that the laws of physics underlie all of the real data that we have. Um, we also know that people are, are all organisms with intentions. We know that the rules of English underlie all English language data. We know that languages are kind of all developed for similar purposes uh, and so forth. And these kind of underlying rules and underlying intentions leads to far greater structure than simply having completely random tasks. Okay. Um, so some informal problem definitions, uh, and we'll define these a little bit more formally next time. Uh, first, the multitask learning problem that we'll be talking about is to try to learn a set of tasks more quickly or more proficiently than learning each of them independently. And the meta-learning problem statement will be given data or experience on a set of previous tasks, so you want to learn a new task more quickly and or more proficiently. So these are going to be the two central problem statements that we're going to be looking at in this course. And we'll be looking at a, class, like a range of methods that solve these two problem statements. And they may not be multitask learning algorithms or meta-learning algorithms per se. There's also other algorithms like transfer learning, for example, that can solve the second problem to some degree. And we'll be covering some of those algorithms in this course as well. Uh, these are the problem statements. And then, yeah, the individual algorithm may be more specific. Great. Um, now, one thing you might be wondering is, doesn't multitask learning just kind of reduce to single task learning? In particular, what if you just took all of your data sets for each of your tasks and took the union of them and set your loss function to be the sum of all of your individual task loss functions? Uh, so in this sense, well, maybe we're just done with the course. Uh, we, we just kind of take this, take the union of our data sets, take the sum of our loss functions, and then apply standard machine learning to our problem, and we're like done with multitask learning. Um, and in many ways, uh, this is right. Yes, you can kind of reduce it to single task learning, and aggregating the data across tasks and learning a single model is one successful approach to multitask learning. Um, but we can often also do better. Uh, we can often kind of exploit the fact that we know that this data is coming from different tasks and use that to develop better algorithms. Okay, um, so there are some questions in the chat. Let's start with, um, let's start with the question from of would transfer learning fall under the umbrella of meta learning? So when I talked about the problem statements before, um, the, these are very general problem statements. And in the meta-learning problem, for example, I'll call this the meta-learning problem, but there are uh, kind of a range of techniques that solve this problem, including transfer learning techniques and meta-learning techniques. Uh, there is a distinction between meta-learning and transfer learning. Um, one way that I like to think about the distinction is that meta-learning algorithms are explicitly optimizing for effective transfer with a certain amount of data, whereas transfer learning methods tend to actually kind of hand design techniques that, that lead to good transfer rather than explicitly optimizing for good transfer with a set of tasks. Um, is asking what is the main difference between multitask learning and meta-learning? Is it that in meta-learning you're training from scratch on all the tasks? And the main thing that is different is that um, in meta-learning, you often want to try to solve a new task uh, more quickly or more proficiently, uh, given kind of previous experience, whereas in multitask learning, you're kind of given a set of tasks and you want to do well on all of these tasks at the same time. Um, one approach to the meta-learning problem may be to basically just take this new task and add this to the task data that you had before and then apply a multitask learning algorithm. Um, one thing that's a bit different in meta-learning is that typically we assume that um, after we've trained on these previous tasks, we're not going to revisit all that data and experience. We're just going to try to apply 
um, what we've learned to a new task, uh, basically essentially compile all of this previous ex experience into a single model or into a single set of parameters, and then use that compiled experience to uh, when learning a new task. Um, I was asking why not a weighted sum here? Uh, you could definitely also have a weighted sum in problems where that may make sense. And we'll get into the, some of the more details of that in the next lecture. Um, and then there's also a question, would self-supervised learning be a subset or superset of meta-learning? Um, I think it depends on the application. I would say both. I think that in some situations it may be considered a subset, in some conditions it may be considered a superset. Um, I think it kind of, yeah, really depends on what sort of application you have in mind. Lots more questions. So is model agnostic meta-learning for fast adaptation of deep networks also an approach to this meta-learning problem uh, in parallel with RL approaches? Uh, so yes, the, the model agnostic meta-learning algorithm is attempting to kind of address the meta-learning problem. And then and uh, would like me to reiterate on the differences between transfer learning and meta-learning. So we'll talk about this a bit more later, um, but the, uh, in my mind, kind of the key difference is that in transfer learning, well, there are a few differences. Uh, so in transfer learning, you often design something, uh, you often kind of take some prior experience and design some rule to transfer what you've learned previously to a new task. So one way to do this is fine tuning, where you take a model trained on previous tasks and then fine tune it for a new task. This is kind of a, a um, kind of a hand design scheme to transfer knowledge from one task to another. Whereas in meta learning, what you'll do is you'll take a set of tasks and try to explicitly optimize for transferability. Essentially explicitly optimize for good generalization performance after seeing a small amount of data for a new task. Um, so this is kind of one of the one of the more salient differences between the two. Cool. Um, and then there's also a question, what about the on what about online learning or training at test time? Um, is that similar in concept to meta learning? Any key differences? We'll talk about uh, online learning and lifelong learning later in the course. And there are actually a lot of synergies between the two. There are actually methods that apply meta learning for the problem of when you receive a stream of tasks or a stream of data points. Uh, and we'll talk about that later in the course. Okay, um, so those were, I think, all the questions. Um, why now? So why should we study multitask learning and meta-learning now? Um, so it turns out people were actually thinking about a lot of these ideas back in the 1990s, a long time ago. Uh, so for example, this is a paper by Rich uh, Karuna, where he was looking at uh, basically thinking about training tasks in parallel using a shared representation. Um, saying that kind of you want to do multitask inductive transfer and add extra tasks and extra outputs to a back propagation net. So he was also thinking about this in the context of neural networks. In 1998, Sebastian Thren, who was uh, formerly a, a professor here, was thinking about how humans can generalize correctly even from a single training example, just like the few shot learning tasks that you did earlier. And when faced with a new thing to learn, humans can usually exploit an enormous amount of training data and new experiences that stem from other related learning tasks. Uh, further, Sammy Bengio in 1992 was thinking about the possibility for a learning rule that can learn to solve new tasks. So in all of these cases, uh, people were thinking about the problems of multitask learning and meta-learning uh, many, many years ago. So why should we care about it now? And why is it quite relevant now? So these algorithms are really continuing to play a fundamental role in machine learning research. For example, in natural language processing, people have looked at uh, multilingual machine translation, training uh, uh, for language translation across 102 languages and surpassing strong uh, prior methods. Uh, people have also been looking at text-to-text -text transformers, training a multitask model that can solve um, all of these different tasks at once, including summarization, question answering, and so forth. In robotics, we've done some work on one-shot imitation learning, where you want to be able to learn 
uh, a new task, in this case, placing an object into a red bowl from a single video of a human. So we'll talk about how this works later in the course. Um, and also people have looked at trying to train across multiple different domains in simulation in order to transfer to the real world. So uh, this is a paper from 2017 from Faresh Te Sinegi uh, that looked at training across lots of different environments in simulation and then ultimately transferring this to a real quadcopter in the real world. Uh, and beyond NLP and robotics, people looked at this in a range of other domains as well. So here's another example, actually a case study that we'll talk about in the next lecture where um, researchers at Google are looking at using multiple, um, optimizing multiple objectives in a YouTube recommendation system. Um, beyond those papers, I think that these algorithms are also playing an increasing role in machine learning research. It's a bit difficult to study uh, how many papers are using a particular kind of technique. Uh, but if you look at Google search queries for multitask learning and meta learning, you see an increase, a pretty big in increase from 2015 to 2020. Um, also, if you look at citations, this isn't a perfect measure, but uh, if you look at citations for papers in transfer, transfer learning, meta learning, and multitask learning, uh, there's also a pretty big increase suggesting that more people are looking at these kinds of algorithms and trying to apply them to different uh, domains. Uh, and then lastly, I think that the success of these algorithms will be critical for the democratization of deep learning. So as I mentioned before, deep neural networks require a massive amount of data in order to successfully learn tasks. Uh, and if you look at some of the most common data sets in uh, in computer vision, in natural language processing, and in speech. Uh, these data sets have 1.2 million images and labels, 40 million paired sentences, 300 hours of labeled data. And in, in, in contrast, if you look at um, some example real world problems, such as a diabetic retinopathy detection data set, um, this has 35,000 labeled images. If you look at uh, an epilepsy treatment paper that was looking at using reinforcement learning, that had less than an hour of data. And uh, in some of the work that we've done with learning for robotic manipulation, if we want to train a robot to do a new task, we may only have around 15 minutes of data. Uh, so we need to think about how we might move, move uh, past single task, large scale supervised learning if we really want to solve some of these real world problems. Um, Beyond the kind of the exciting research that has been happening in the past several years uh, and that we'll talk about in this course, there's also still many, many open questions and challenges. I think that this makes this, uh, this topic especially exciting uh, from a research point of view because of all of these open questions and challenges. And uh, this, in some ways, this is a bit of a disclaimer that a lot of the things that we'll be talking about in this course are still being developed and a lot of the ideas that we'll be talking about are really at the forefront of where the research is. Okay, so any questions um, to, at, to wrap things up? So there's a question from saying that for multitask learning to work, the tasks need to be similar. Is this the case for meta learning as well? Uh, yeah, and this is the case. So if, if the tasks, well, and I guess I'll, I'll qualify that a little bit. Um, they need to share some amount of structure. They don't need to necessarily be extremely similar. They just need to have some shared um, shared structure, some, something that they share that the algorithm can latch onto in order to learn, learn more quickly or in order to learn more proficiently than learning completely from scratch. Uh, so this is an important assumption that underlies all of these algorithms. Okay. Um, Great, so is also asking, is there a way to quantitatively measure how similar two tasks are and uh, in general settings and in reinforcement learning settings? So there's actually very little work on measuring similarity. Uh, and it's also a really difficult problem because if you want to measure the similarity of two tasks, it in many ways depends not only on the tasks, the data sets and loss functions, but may also depend on your current representation, what you've learned about in the world, 
and so forth. So for example, if you know how to grasp um, if you know how to grasp objects, then a task of um, of like of two tasks kind of that involve grasping objects may appear more similar um, than than otherwise. Uh, in, in also, if you don't know how to grasp objects, then um, then it may be more difficult to recognize some of the shared structure between other tasks. Uh, it also kind of depends on what you want to learn from something as well. So. If you want to learn the problem of um, what's a good example, uh, writing, um, if you want to like learn how to write different uh, different characters or something, then the task of the kind of the, the thing that that all those tasks share is being like holding a pen in a certain way. And so, if you haven't yet learned how to hold a pen in a certain way, that those tasks may share a lot of structure because you first need to learn that to learn both of those tasks. But after you've learned how learn how to hold the pen in that way, then those tasks may appear less similar because the, the new thing that you need to learn is very different for the two tasks. Um, so this is one thing that makes basically it quite challenging to understand uh, the difference between two tasks because it also depends on your current representation and your current model. So um, another person is asking, do all camera-based perception algorithms fall under similar tasks and can be solved using multitask learning and meta learning? Um, a lot of the multitask learning benchmarks uh, on, in the computer vision domain uh, do look actually a lot like this, where you're training single model to segment and detect and predict surface normals and so forth. Uh, so yes, that kinda, that's kind of the, the short answer to that question. Um, yeah, and then I guess for the rest of these questions, I think we'll leave these to the future lectures. These are all really great questions, but I think they're all things that we'll also be covering in the, uh, in the coming lectures as well. So I encourage you to keep on asking questions and so forth. Uh, and then next time on Wednesday, we'll be talking about multitask learning and transfer learning basics. I'll also stick around to answer any lingering questions as well. Uh, but for the sake of the lecture, thank you everyone for showing up. And um, yeah, and I'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs>